got into filmmaking. I got into filmmaking because I was a painter. I had studied actually at Concordia, uh, painting, art history, and I just didn't imagine myself being locked up in a room alone and painting the rest of my life. And somebody was looking for an assistant editor. This somebody was uh, Susan Skelton Levine. She was doing a series of films about John Grierson. So it was just an amazing entry into the world of cinema, specifically into documentary cinema, because um, I was exposed to Grierson's philosophy, to his way of thinking. We had the incredible luxury of working with film prints on a steam bag, and we could take any National Film Board film, cut it up, put it together, and as I was working with Susan, she was pregnant. And when she got to sort of eight months or seven months, she felt she couldn't work anymore. So she just let me work away. And I just loved it. And I thought, wow, filmmaking's amazing. And so then I decided, well, if I'm going to be a filmmaker, I should really learn how to make an image, especially as a painter. I was very close to the whole visual aspect of things. And so I then went to study cinematography at the Polish Film School stayed in Poland for 10 years, and then came back to my hometown, Montreal. So Bad Girl uh, speaks about women's sexuality, uh, the multiple expressions of how women themselves have spoken about sexuality. So it covers um, uh, filmmakers, uh, writers, porn stars, activists, but it's extremely, how shall I say, um, it's just preoccupied with um, questioning the very nature of pornography. What is it? What isn't it? You know, the whole issue of female sexuality and female desire hasn't really been sufficiently covered to this day. In fact, when I think of the film Bad Girl, I sometimes wonder if that film could even be made today, even though the whole issue of female sexuality has definitely been discussed in the last 20 years. I mean, the film was made in 2002, so in fact, that's what, 12 years now. So we have come a long way, but the place for women's voices with regards to sexuality is you know, still a, a mar is still marginalized to some extent. So it's certainly a discussion that has to keep continuing. I think that Bad Girl was definitely um, a kind of an, uh, how shall I say, a pioneering film in many ways. Um, but it's also a survey film. It's an introduction to the subject. Many more things could be said and done uh, concerning sexuality and specifically women's sexuality. So it was a film that was made to sort of get the conversation going about female sexuality and female desire. Documentary Doc filmmaking can express our human existence, I believe, in a better, more complete way than any other art form, any other genre of cinema. It can it sort of enable you to say, uh, hey, look at this. This is what I'm thinking, this is what I'm seeing, this is what I'm hearing, this is what's important to me. I also love the improvised nature of documentary. When I say improvised, I say that it's a process of discovery. It's not like a fixed screenplay in fiction. It's you, you, when you embark upon a project you have to be prepared to be changed by it forever. You have to be prepared to search. You have to be prepared to go with the flow uh, and yet to maintain um, a point of view that's not a fixed one, that's truly open to a dialogue and a living exchange with people. That's what I love about documentary. Well, you know, the intersection of art and politics is a huge question, um, but I think that all great art ultimately is political, is ideological. It affects the body politic. Anytime you 
speak. I mean speaking in the sense of art making, <laughs> because I think that uh, whether we are talking about images or sounds or the spoken word, I think that the merging of these into cinema is also a way, a powerful way, in fact, maybe the most powerful way of speaking. Um, so, you know, I mean, I mean, we're talking about bad girl, right? I mean, so how is sexuality political? I mean, undoubtedly, you know, since the, you know, second wave of feminists whose motto could well have been the personal is political, I mean, we understand how our lives are affected by, by political circumstances, by political contexts. So the issue of contextualizing, I think, in cinema is, is often what makes it political because we, 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 we place our subject, we place events within a context and that context uh, is very often a political context. To go back to the is issue of sexuality, I mean, of course it's political because um, it's determined by um, our, our thinking about it, uh, discourses, Sex, discourses about sexuality are absolutely uh, defined by, um, you know, uh, um, discourses. Of, uh, one can speak about sexu sexuality without without speaking about discourses of power, and and what bad girl tries to do is to try to displace that discourse by contributing the voices and the multiple voices of women that are reflecting and speaking about sexuality. Well, I just finished um, a new film called Breaking the Frame, which is very much related to Bad Girl in the sense that it's a film that in a way grew out of <laughs> bad girl, and I guess that would be true of my whole filmography, that uh, one film grows out of the next in some kind of a floral configuration that other people can speak about. But I definitely, when I finish a film, I then sort of think, oh, but what else would I have wanted to say or do? And so that's breaking the frame. So um, Breaking the Frame is a film, I like to say, through Carole Schneeman, not just about, because about always suggests a kind of a distance and that you're outside of it. So I like to say through, um, because it's, um, it's a continuation of my reflection about the body, uh, whereas Bad Girl was very much, I would say, an introduction to the subject. Um, uh, breaking the frame goes deeper into a reflection about the female body. Um, I had excerpted uh, a film by Carolee Schneeman, Fuses, that many people know, kind of an iconic film from the 60s about women's pleasure and sexuality. Um, but I, when I asked myself the question after Bad Girl, oh man, I met so f many fantastic and interesting women. It just sort of blew my mind. But actually, who's closest to me? Like closest in that kind of organic way when we talk about closeness. And it was definitely Carole Schneeman for many reasons, because she's a visual artist and I come from a visual arts background, because her work moves me enormously, because everything I read from her and about her, I thought was just absolutely fantastic. So I, that's how Breaking the Frame began. That's how it continued. I also felt that while Bad Girl is, was a fascinating process for me and just meeting all these fantastic women was just priceless. Um, it's, it, when you look at my whole filmography, it doesn't necessarily represent, it's, it's what you call a talking heads film in many ways. And it suited me fine because I always thought, well, 
we're bombarded with images, but we never talk about it. Okay, so let's make a Talking Heads film. Let's talk about it. We, that's exactly what we never do. But I'm, but I'm a filmmaker who loves to also, how should I say, kind of express um, how, in some kind of a deeper way, how we experience spaces and places and people, how we perceive. <laughs> so that, so that's, so, so in many ways, the, you know, the new film, Breaking the Frame, is formally very different. But I think probably quite complementary to Bad Girl. Ha! <laughs> Don't get me going about support and distribution. <laughs> I, <laughs> I mean, it's such a problem. I mean, we're all of us filmmakers are aware of the issues. Um, uh, thankfully, uh, television is television broadcast is no longer the only venue. Uh, for uh, disseminating documentary and also for um, subsidizing it, I mean, for contributing, funding it, you know? Um, because it's a, it's a little, I mean, it, it was a little bit of a problem. I mean, there's been some great, great work that has been made for broadcast television. I'm absolutely not denying that. Uh, but I think that there must be other alternatives. Of course, the National Film Board uh, played an extraordinary role in Canada in terms of uh, dissemination and distribution. Um, but in many ways, it's been dismantled over the years. I, there are certainly still possibilities to do things, and they still do fantastic work. But it's extremely difficult for independent filmmakers not only to make the work, but to get it out there. So obviously, um, online dissemination is helping things somewhat. Um, but it's, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a huge problem. It's a huge problem. I mean, groups like Cinema Politica are doing amazing work, amazing work in getting films that people would never see out there, uh, getting them out into the public so that there could be a discourse about the issues. Um, but yeah, we, we all would like to see um, the world change <laughs> with regards to dissemination of documentary cinema. Um, yeah, I mean, the, you know, we can't talk about documentary dissemination, uh, distribution, without a thought about the system of gatekeepers, I would say. Um, festivals have become an important way to, in a way, distribute uh, many documentary films that don't have the possibility uh, for uh, broadcast screening, don't necessarily have the possibility of a theatrical release. And so festivals have become very important, but we should really try to analyze uh, to what extent they've also begun playing the role of gatekeepers. I mean, in a society where you could make something which, of course, you can, even with this equipment you have here, which is wonderful. It's the idea that Alexandre Struc had, whoa, you know, back in the 30s, that uh, the camera can be a pen. Well, it's now true. The camera can be a pen, and we don't have a problem with an access to the making. I mean, anyone can make a film today. Anyone has access to the equipment to make a film today. Certainly, well, anyone. Let's just say in the wealthy Western world. But to get it out there is now the big problem. And um, the, I think that the whole structure uh, needs to be rethought. 
I think that online streaming is going to be a very interesting solution. I think what we need more than anything today are interesting platforms that come with programmers and curators that are out there searching because the problem is that there's just way too much stuff and it's everybody's problem and who could sift through it? I mean, we understand that some festivals uh, essentially receive, I don't know, 2,000, 5,000, 10,000 applications. I mean, who has the budget to go through that stuff? So, very often, there is a kind of a tendency to base oneself on names that you already know. Well, where does that leave young emerging filmmakers uh, who are just trying to make their name? So it's, it's, uh, I mean, it's a, it, it, it's a huge issue. And definitely groups like Cinema Politica are doing a lot to address this issue by providing this alternative space that's working. But I think that we, that's, personally I think that that's the direction that we ought to be uh, uh, taking is curated autonomous spaces where uh, groups of people, communities are formed around certain uh, ideologies, uh, around certain pre aesthetic preferences, and because the issue is not just to get it out there, but to create a discourse around it. I mean, that's why we make films, is so that people can then exchange and uh, ideas could grow and uh, uh, evolution, uh, not in some uh, Darwinian sense, but very concrete uh, evolution of consciousness could occur. Well, Cinema Politica is just fantastic. I mean, uh, before Cinema Politica proved that it was possible to have a fantastic and regular audience coming to in, see engaged cinema on a regular basis, everybody said, oh, it's not possible. So they've actually proved that with a kind of a strong and very coherent curatorial programming perspective that they can not only show films, have audiences come to these films, but actually build a community of engaged citizens. And that's absolutely extraordinary what they're doing. And of course, I know the Concordia chapter much better than the other ones, but I hear that the other ones are doing very well. So, I, I mean, I think that, I think that Cinema Politica, in fact, provides us for an alternative model for the uh, distribution and dissemination of documentary. And um, I, I, you know, since we were talking about this issue of distribution and new forms of distribution, as much as I like to, to, to say that online distribution is something that's very interesting, I'm a real believer in people getting physically into one room and experiencing a film in that room. I know that a certain energy is created in circumstances like that. And Cinema Politica has, has simply proven that it's possible. That's huge. It's huge. Didn't happen overnight. We're talking about something that you have to build over many years but they've proven that it's possible. And it, to me, that's extremely hopeful. And I, in fact, can't imagine 
a kind of a media landscape in Montreal without it anymore. People can trust that what they will see there will be interesting and will be good. So programming, curating is extremely important. It's not just a place. I mean, everybody, everybody, Cinema Politica is not just any old place. Everybody leads busy lives today. People don't have that much time for extra things. But the attendance at Cinema Politica screenings is fantastic. Because that public has been convinced by very... Uh, a, a very well, um, uh, very well programmed um, seasons, I would have to say, because it kind of goes in seasons. So you know, not to mention only Svetla and Ezra, but the whole team, because I know this is teamwork. It's a it's a huge accomplishment. It's a huge accomplishment to have built. A, um, a trustful public.